Um, before we go on to our keynote speakers, um, everything about what we're doing over the next three days is about communicating, however you communicate. And we have tried to make it possible in every way that we can, but please come to us if there's anything that you should need. But firstly, I would like to tell you, you have a headset in front of you should you need translation. And Minister Stoja will be speaking in German, so you will be able to go to channel three should you require an English uh, interpretation. I also would like to please give um, our warmest support and welcome to our interpretation team over here, to Hannah, to Georg, to Marietta and to Lena, who will be doing deaf interpretation and will be working very hard for the next three days. So a round of applause please to them, because we have a lot of speakers. And this year we've brought in something a little bit different or just to ensure that you all get the chance to talk and meet to each other. We have two meeting places outside in the lobby. One is downstairs and that has an induction loop for you as well should you require. Please use those facilities as best you can to have as many conversations as you can. Okay, we have an extraordinary three keynote speakers. And though I think every year they are great, for me, this is a particularly fabulous year of keynote speakers. And our very first keynote speaker today is Daniela Bass, who is the Director of the Division of Social Policy and Development of the UN Department of Economics and Social Affairs. However, for all of us, she is incredibly well known and we are very, very appreciative that she's come to join us here today. So a very, very warm round of applause to Daniela Bass. Guten Tag, and now I switch to English. Good morning. Uh, Your Excellency Minister Stöger, and then of course uh, Mr. Essel, as well as uh, Mr. Uh, Yukskul, and, um, and then also Mrs. Uh, Six Hackel. Excellencies, ladies, gentlemen, friends and acquaintances. I see so many friends on this, uh, in, in this room, and so, since I do have the honor to lead a big division with a big portfolio, the Division for Social Policy and Development at the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs based in New York. And in my portfolio, I, I do have a big family. I have uh, uh, social groups uh, such as persons with disabilities and the youth, older persons, the family, indigenous peoples, so um, I have the honor to lead a division that um, houses all these focal points for the whole United Nations system. And the mandates we have are to eradicate poverty, to promote employment and decent work, social integration and inclusion, and reduce the gap of inequalities. So we are responsible to um, implement the mandates of governments when it comes to the social dimension on, of sustainable development. Uh, besides this, allow me also to greet and thank, uh, within the division I lead, uh, the section that deals with the disability and also serves as a secretariat to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, known as a CRPD, SCRPD, and I have with me a colleague, Eric Sung. Thank you very much, Eric. So he will, will be also supporting us all in giving answers later on if needed. I would like to bring your attention on three points. I would like to share with you and engage with you on three, on three things. The first one, why? Why persons with disabilities are facing still this reality of uh, less opportunities than uh, persons without disabilities. And the focus is employment, so it will be on employment at these days. Um, the second thing I would like to bring your attention to and engage you with the, in conversations, and then hear also from the private sector and others present here today, are the costs that this implies. When persons with disabilities are hired and or uh, hire themselves in any case are in the labor market and the costs when this does not happen to the community and to governments 
And the third thing I would like to bring and engage with you in a conversation later on is what can we, we do? Simple. What can we do? Now, um, I will follow the, the speech prepared by my, my staff, but um, allow me also sometimes to open up a parenthesis and share with you something more personal. You see, I'm wearing here today many hats. I'll try to stick to the hat of a director of a division, the one I just mentioned to you. But I'm also wearing here other hats, such as the one of being a woman, and sometimes women still face some, some sort of inequalities when it comes to employment. And I'm also wearing another hat, the hat of a person who herself has a disability. You, you see, um, when it comes to the United Nations, the United Nations is heavily promoting the, facilitate, the facilitations of job-rich economies. We want that to happen. And we also, United Nations, are trying to promote full employment because we know that these are key, crucial elements to development. And we need uh, to promote social policies in our case that promote development, social development, that promote social justice. But we also have to consider uh, another kind of justice, which is economic justice. And what about the environment? So, um, if we listen to the words that uh, were delivered recently by the newly appointed Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, in, uh, in uh, celebrating the World Day of Social Justice, he referred by saying, equitable and inclusive access to decent work and income generating activities are central to building resilient societies. Many of the global frameworks and commitments guiding development policies today also give clear recognition of the role of employment, including the recently adopted 2030 Agenda and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the agenda, the 2030 Agenda is our 17 goals that governments, 194, as many are members of the United Nations, have given themselves. By the year 2030, that's why 2030 agenda, 17 goals have to be reached. And, uh, and the beauty of this agenda is that it is universal. It applies to all countries, developed, developing, and emerging countries. And it is accountable, meaning that, that these 17 goals have to be reached by governments, and they are accountable to the world for achieving these 17 goals. So our role as UN, your role as private sector or NGOs or any other stakeholders that might be present here, even us as individuals, is to provide the necessary support to the endeavors of the United Nations. That means the endeavors of the 2030 Agenda. That means the realization of these 17 goals. That means mainstreaming disabilities in all these goals. And persons with disabilities. I've heard that today, you see, there is a goal, goal 17, for instance, the last one, talks about partnerships. And I think this is what's happening here today. We are partnering, each of us with our different expertise. So far, I've heard, and I, I really appreciate it, we have to help them. And this is a wonderful way of starting a partnership. I do hope in the near future to, ha to hear we, we, not we, them. Who are them? So we know that persons uh, with disabilities are less likely to be employed than their peers uh, without disabilities and studies have found the uh, employment rate of persons with disabilities to be around 20% lower in many countries. And persons with disabilities are even less likely to participate in the labor market at all. Why is this the reality? 
See, persons with disabilities are often discouraged from looking for a job. There is even data that shows that many people consider it unfair to give work to persons with disabilities when persons without disabilities are jobless. And trust me, I've heard that story on me too. I do recall when I was at the university uh, in Trieste, which is not far from here, and it was built during the period of, of fascism, so there are many, many, many steps. And I became paraplegic due to a cancer when I was six years old. I survived. I wanted to study. I knew. You see, I have been so lucky. My parents empowered me. They allowed, they found ways for me to go to school, to the ordinary school, because in those years in Italy, there was still the law that children with disabilities, no matter what kind of disability, mental, sensory, physical, they all went to, to the special school. All there, puff, a bunch. My parents, and I had a visionary, I was so blessed, a dean of the primary school, even though there were no laws in Italy yet of including, integrating, uh, uh, children with disabilities in the ordinary school, but they saw that for the simple fact that I was not walking any longer, I had to go to a special school where there were children with so many different needs, also mental ones. What, what hope would, have, would I have had later on? So my parents fought for me. They empowered me. They empowered me. And then, now it's my turn, and this is me not as a director, as Daniela Bass, to empower others. To, to empower others. <laughs> Therefore, you see, when people still told me at the university, once I made it because the university didn't want to eliminate architectural barriers because it was expensive. So you see, it is not the disability that makes a person poor. It's the environment. It is the environment. Barriers, barriers, barriers. Yes, transportation, access to places, leisure activities, all of these are barriers, but even where some of these barriers are removed. Say, architectural barriers, you remove steps to go to work. But then, is it always true that once I have access to a place, I can move and use what's offered within that place? Not really. So it's not just a matter of eliminating architectural barriers, allowing access in. Once you are in, you also have to be able to use what's available. Now, so it is the environment that makes people poor, not the disability. With some exceptions, of course, there are some disabilities that are particularly serious. So, so when people told me, well, but you don't, if you do not go to work, you will have a social pension. I won't. I don't have a disability, but if I don't work, I don't have a social pension. Now, do we understand here that we are talking to another human being? Do we realize that there are many persons with disabilities that are the only members who work in the family and they support their families? Do we ever look at that? Or we still think and look at things through the lenses of prejudice, stereotype, them and we? Now, despite these tremendous gaps, and scarcity of possibilities and negative attitudes, there is promise. In the United Nations, our dialogue has shifted from the charitable cause or the medical cause to a completely different perspective. We have adopted a focus on disability inclusion and we recognize persons with disabilities as agents of change. With the convention in force, as it was mentioned in the, the year 2008, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Human Rights, or Rights in General, perfect. We do know, though, that rights, if they do not have strong social policy frameworks at national uh, level in place, you need policies, social policies 
in place at national level, rights cannot be implemented. They stay as written laws in a book, in a shelf. So, great to have rights. Now, here today, we are to discuss ways to make these rights become a reality, action-oriented how to implement them, what kind of policies do we need. And policies are not just made by governments. You see, I used to work as a CEO in the past in the, in the private sector. I'm also a business and a life coach, as well as a journalist and broadcaster. I went in and out to the United Nations. My career hasn't always been in the UN. And I do know that policies are also made within the private sector by the companies themselves. And what I see happening lately is that why governments and the international world are going towards a certain direction, the private sector is slowly, slowly creating its own laws and moves in a different direction. We have to talk together. We have to create partnerships. Unity gives strength. It's a win-win situation. Now, I know I'm speaking far too long. I'll try to skip uh, a few things. but. Um, so beyond these moral imperatives uh, that I also mentioned, rights and, uh, rights and laws, what are the costs? Now let's move to the second point, the costs. Available data and studies show that the cost for excluding persons with the disabilities in the labor market could be steep as high as nearly 7% seven, seven of the national GDP in economic terms. For example, the World Bank, uh, we have a colleague here from the World Bank, uh, in one report published in 2008 shows that, for instance, in Bangladesh, the exclusion of people with disabilities from the labor market results in a total estimated loss of $891 million per year. Income losses among adult caregivers adds because, of course, if you don't go to work, you stay at home or in, in an institution, you need a caregiver. So you also have to provide to caregivers, right? How much a caregiver costs? Well, about 234 million per year, when actually this person could very well work and actually contribute to the growth of the society. In the Canadian case, the annual GDP loss was estimated between 8.8 .8 .8 .8 and 7.7% in the year 2008, so what can we do? Rather than the passive, passive provision of services and opportunities uh, to group uh, or segments of the society need, the focus of our efforts must be on empowerment. Given the tools, the ways, the means, the environment, and in, in the year 2019, the um, ECOSOC, I won't go into details, but it's the, the theme of the Economic and Social Council of Ministers of the United Nations, which then uh, precedes the General Assembly. The theme will be empowerment. So you could start thinking about that, right? Um, persons with disabilities and the various social groups uh, once empowered through concrete actions and removal of barriers, of course, various, various kinds of barriers, and through creating enabling conditions to ensure equal opportunities for them to participate in a meaningful manner on equitable terms, then we have reached finally what we have in mind. Um, specific accessibility rights, are very well championed in the United Nations and by those who um, come to the United Nations and work with the United Nations. What we need to achieve is the mainstreaming of disability as a natural, natural consideration of all issues related to development and to mainstream the disability perspective and participation of persons with disabilities in this regard, okay? So encouraging governments, civil society, the private sector, and have, you know, have been uh, initiatives that proved to be successful, and I'm really curious and, and, and ready to, to listen to you all. I could mention to you many countries that have already started implementing this kind of, of um, um, action by empowering persons with disabilities in the employment market, but I will, I will share with you later on what you wish to. 
Um, I would like to conclude by saying that yes, there is a tremendous need to, to change mindset. Mindset of governments, mindset of societies. And when it comes to training, who are, who, who are we going to train here? Persons with disabilities? Or are we trying also to train entrepreneurs, the media, policy makers? Training is needed there. Otherwise, training goes only, only on the side of one, on, of one group. And it's unbalanced. It's really unbalanced. Um, um, so I would like, uh, on behalf of my division, the Division for Social Policy and Development of UNDESA, to extend my special appreciation to the ESSEL Foundation and the World Future Council for this initiative. Confucio says, and here I conclude, and apologies for those who have already heard it, but I just love it. What I, what I see, I forget. No, I'm sorry. What I hear, I forget. What I see, I remember. What I do, what I do, what I do, I understand. So let us do what is the best in order to leave no one behind. Let's do together. Thank you. You see, she is absolutely fantastic. Daniela, thank you so much for wearing all of your hats, for all of you for coming as a Daniela Bass. And it once again proves so much that no label should define any one of us as a human being. We are made up of so many labels and so many hats and so many parts of ourselves. And it was fantastic to meet all of you from the stage. So thank you so very much today. Um, see, this is why Zero is great.